church six years ago, we were, um, I was with a couple of friends and we were in Colorado and we had this project we were working on, but then we had some time to do some hiking in the Rocky Mountains and we were getting ready to fly back. And it just so happened it was that time when there was unusual tornado activity in the Midwest, but I didn't think much about it because those tornadoes were like states away and so I thought nothing about getting on a plane when that was happening. But when we were walking to our departure gate, we heard somebody get on for the airport, and so that everybody in the airport heard the same message. They said, please be advised, no matter where you are flying, no matter how long you will be flying, due to expected turbulence, you will not be permitted to unbuckle your seatbelt for the entirety of the flight. Please be advised, they said, you will not be permitted to use the lavatory during the entirety of the flight. Friend, a word to the wise. If you ever hear them say that in the airport, that no matter where you're flying, no matter how long your flight is, you will not be permitted to even use the restroom. Don't even ask. Don't get on the plane. (laughs) Friends, I've been in turbulence before. This was not turbulence. That was an understatement. It was like a roller coaster ride in the sky. It was up and down. We were doing this. I had to quit looking up. I had to look down because when you looked up, you were doing this. God bless our flight attendant. She was committed. She got up and tried to serve us drinks. (laughs) Like people were going to be able to drink anything, you know? And it finally, when the plane flew, flipped her into the lap of someone and then took the cart and slammed it against the side, and some people screamed. She got up, ran to her seat, buckled in, and stayed there the rest. I thought, we're going to (laughs) die. I've never been closer to Jesus than in that moment. And I had my seatbelt so tight I could barely feel my legs. I was holding on for dear life because it was just tossing you around. And that's when I looked over, and before it got real bad, my friends that I went hiking with, they started laughing. They said, Chad, you scared? (laughs) <laughs> Chad, can you hang on that side seat any tighter, Chad? <laughs> well, what they didn't know is that I had prayed for everybody in the plane except for the two of them. <laughs> and if that plane went down, everyone was covered, but God helped their souls, right? <laughs> Jerks, jeez. I mean, it was terrifying. It, was never, it would not let up until we landed. Now, guess what happens every time I go get on a plane since? Rationally. I tell myself, plane's one of the safest modes of transportation you can ever take. Rationally, I tell myself, Chad, you have been on many flights, never experienced turbulence like that. You've been on many flights since then, not experienced turbulence like that. There is no reason to make your whole future flying experience be based on that one bad experience. I tell myself that. I I go through this. I do the positive self-talk and everything I'm supposed to do. But I sit in that plane and it all goes out the window as my heart begins to pound for fear that what I experienced once, I will experience again. And I know this might sound strange at first, but that illustrates my problem with Easter. I know that Easter is supposed to be the time, the one time that you all can count on the pastor who's speaking for the day to be uplifting and encouraging and make it all about um, colored eggs and new life and Jesus overcame the grave and, there's, and the resurrection, and, and yet I'm going to do that and of course we'll do that. But, but you have to understand the problem that I have with Easter is that I, I think you could say I've lived a little bit too much of life. I mean, for some, compared to some of you, I've lived a whole lot more life. Compared to others of you, I have a whole lot more life that I could possibly live. But I've lived enough life at this point <laughs> to fear hope a little bit. Because I've been in the turbulence of life. I've been through the disappointments. I've been through the heartbreaks. I've, I've seen the losses that I don't understand. And so... Forgive me if it makes me a little gun-shy when it comes to hope. Afraid to hope. Doesn't that sound strange when you say it out loud? Sounds like an oxymoron. How in the world do you put those two words together? Afraid to hope. But if you doubt that maybe you think you're the one who has never feared to hope, I would challenge that and say, if you've ever found yourself thinking or uttering these words, then perhaps you too know what I'm talking about when I say I'm a little bit afraid to hope because I've lived a little too much of life. If you've ever said these words, don't get your hopes up. You ever said that? You ever thought that? Ever felt that? Hey, don't get your hopes up. <laughs> 
I have some friends who, that's a phrase that helps them cope right now. Because they've been to the baby showers of all their friends. They've had people ask them so many times, when's it going to be your turn? That they've learned to redirect that question before the people can even ask that question because they cannot endure hearing, let alone trying to answer that question one more time. It's just too painful for them. And as they try one last expensive attempt to do what it seems like is so easy for so everyone else, to have a child of their own that they can hold and love, they tell those they're closest to us, listen, we're trying one more time. But we're trying not to get our hopes up. Because it's how they protect themselves. Because when you've been devastated by disappointment, and you've been through that again and again, and life keeps on proving to you that you should be afraid to hope, you hold back a little bit, and you say, I'm, I'm, not trying to, I'm just trying not to get my hopes up, because you don't want to go through that turbulence again. Another friend of mine was laid off about a year ago. Been out of work for a year. Laid off from a company he'd given 20 years of his life to. They gave him a, a small severance package. He's grateful for anything. You should be, 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 be. He was grateful for it. But at the same time, it was not nearly enough. He had no idea it would be a year and he would still be looking for work. And people have encouraged him and said, hey, with all your experience, you're a shoe in some place. But the problem that he has found is, at least from his perspective, it seems like his experience translates into, it would be cheaper for us as a company to hire someone with less experience than you. And so it seems like all he gets, well, all he does get is rejection notices, emails, letters, phone calls. So much so that it's hard for him to look into the eyes of his wife anymore and hold his head up. And so when his wife asked him after another day of submitting some more applications and sending out some more of his resumes, asked him, how did it go today? He looks in her eye and he says, listen, I got some leads, but don't get your hopes up. And he says that as much for her, maybe even more so for her than for himself, because maybe, maybe it'll be easier to look her in the eye if she doesn't get her hopes up so much the next time he gets a rejection letter. You see, when you've been through hurt, when you've lived enough of life to know that life doesn't always turn out as you hope it would, as you pray it would, as you need it to, when you've run up against those barriers, you've been in the plane when you're not even allowed to get up and use the restroom, so to speak, then all of a sudden you hold back a bit and you say, I'm just trying not to get my hopes up. But wouldn't it be great if we could go back to before we learned to say, don't get your hopes up? Wouldn't that be great? Wouldn't that be freeing? Wouldn't that be fun? Even for just a day, to rewind and go back to the time, before the time you learned, before you lived enough life to learn, don't get your hopes up. Wouldn't that be freeing, fun? Uh, my son, uh, Seth, helped me experience that a few months ago through his nine-year-old view of the world. We were at an outlet mall, and Kimberly and Anna were in a story we weren't interested in. And so we were walking around outside in this outdoor outlet mall, and we came around a corner, and there, sitting in all its chrome shining glory, was a Harley Davidson. And it had this big sign that said, Win me. And Seth said, Dad, are you going to go fill out an entry form? And on the inside, I was thinking, oh, I don't know that I want to do that because I've lived a little too much in life. All you're going to get is a bunch of sales calls, right? But he was so excited, he made me excited. So I went over and I filled it out. And while I was filling out the form, Seth read, uh, read on the poster the rest of the, the message. And it said, you can, if you win, he said, Dad, you can either get a Harley Davidson or you can get $59,000. What would you pick? And I said, oh, Seth, that's easy. I would take the Harley Davidson because if you ask your mom if I'm ever going to get a Harley, she'd say, don't get your hopes up. <laughs> right? I said, Seth, what would you take? And he said, oh, I'd take the money. I said, Seth, what would you do with that money? And his nine-year-old little mind started to imagine what he would do with 59000 And friends, it included me. It was going to be fun. We were going to go on trips. We were going to have a good time. Man, it was, he, I got so caught up. For a minute, I got so caught up in what it was like to hope like a nine-year-old again that I actually saw myself riding down the double A on that Harley with the sun beating in my face and the wind blowing through what used to be my hair and man and one of you one of you good folks one of you good people would let me hide that in your garage so Kimberly would not know it was awesome 
It was freeing, man. It was wonderful. And then Seth ruined it. Yeah, he did. Because he asked me, he brought me back to reality. He said, hey, Dad, do you think we might actually win? And so I tried to avoid it because I didn't want it to end. You know, this was good. And I I said, Seth, it sure is fun imagining we could win, isn't it? But he's gotten too old for me to redirect his questions like that and not answer his questions. So he asked me again, Dad, no, seriously, Dad, do you think we might actually have a chance at winning this? And you know what came out of my mouth? You know what came out of my mouth, right? Don't get your hopes up. Because I've learned a long time ago that those entry things are a whole lot more about marketing and sales calls to get me to buy something and spend my money than it is to ever win their money, right? I've learned that. And so, Seth, don't get your hopes up. And maybe if I can teach, if we can teach the next generation not to get their hopes up so much, then maybe it won't hurt so much when they experience and they've lived a little bit more life. They've experienced what we've experienced, and that is the disappointment, the heartbreak, the devastation, the loss, the brokenness the pain, the innocent suffering when they shouldn't. So don't get your hopes up. And things haven't changed much over 2,000 years. We see in Luke chapter 24, verse 1, on the first Easter, people went to Easter saying, don't get your hopes up. You said, really? I never read that in the Scripture. Well, I didn't actually say that. But it says that not through their words, but through their actions. Luke 24, verse 1. On the first day of the week, very early in the morning, the women took the spices they had prepared and went to the tomb. You see it? The spices. As they go to the tomb with the spices, you can hear them. 2,000 years later, you can hear the echo of their words. Don't get your hopes up. Because their spices was about them not getting their hopes up. Because they, on Friday, they weren't allowed to give Jesus a proper burial because that was the Jewish Sabbath began, began on Friday at sundown. And so uh, the Jewish law said they're not allowed to work like that. And so they had to wait until Sunday morning. And they come to Sunday morning, to Easter morning, to the tomb with spices. Not because they had hope of something, but because they knew hope was gone. But what's interesting about what's strange about it are those scriptures that were on the screen right before the message began. Three times, on three different occasions, Jesus said to his his followers, including these women, listen, I'm going to suffer, I'm going to die, and then I'm going to rise again. Three different times, three different occasions. He doesn't use riddles, he doesn't use parables, he doesn't use stories. He just says it plain as day. Anybody could understand it. I'm going to suffer, I'm going to die, and three days later, I'm going to rise from the dead. So the question is, why are they going to the tomb with spices? Why are they going to the tomb saying, don't get your hopes up? Why aren't they going to the tomb with with streamers and balloons and cakes or whatever you do to celebrate a resurrection? Why aren't they celebrating? Where are the men at? We're the follower apostles of Christ. Why aren't they there saying, oh, we can't wait. I've been waiting, been waiting since Friday. He's coming. He's coming. There it is. He's resurrection. No, they're not doing any of that. They don't have their hopes out at all. They have spices that they're taking to the tomb because they've lived a little bit too much of life. They've been here before. Promises broken. Dreams shattered. Peace robbed by chaos. You can't unsee, you can't unlearn that kind of turbulence. We're not children anymore. Yes, they believed in him. Yes, Jesus did amazing miracles. But they saw what they saw on Friday, and you can't unsee that. You can't unsee that kind of a cruel death and suffering. And when he breathed his last, it felt like somebody came and knocked the wind out of them. And so they come to the tomb with spices. Verse 2 says, They found the stone rolled away from the tomb, but when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. You see, that's why you don't get your hopes up. The only thing they were hoping for on that first Easter was that they would be able to find his body and give this good man that they had come to love a proper burial. And they get there, and the body's not even there. Imagine the disappointment. See, that's why you don't get your hopes up. They're, just, they're not even hoping for life. They're just hoping to see the dead body. And the dead body, isn't it? That's why you don't get your hopes up. 
And I wonder if there's someone, someone going to an Easter service, maybe even here, maybe watching online today, somewhere in some part, other part of the world have found their way into a, a worship service for Easter, and we've come here not carrying hope, but carrying spices. And I wonder how for how many of us, even in the church, our faith has become less about hope and more about just trying to find some peace, just trying to find some solace, just trying to find some comfort, just trying to find some closure in our graveyards. And Lord knows this world could benefit from that. I mean, if, if all we got out of faith was a little bit of comfort and closure and solace and, and peace in a world that can be oftentimes so very cruel, then I guess that would be a win. But what if? Come on, what if? God has you here today for something more. Amen. What if God has you here today, not just so that you can know that there's a God who was willing to suffer and die so he knows what it's like for you to go through what you go through. That would have been plenty for him to do. But what if he came out of the grave to offer you something more? What if this isn't about childish, wishful thinking? What if this is about an adult, mature, deep a depth to it kind of faith and hope that we're being invited to. What if God wants to rob from our lips today that phrase, don't get your hopes up, so that we're no longer afraid to hope, but we are free to hope again. Luke 24 invites us to that. Verse 4, while they were wondering about this, suddenly two men in clothes that gleamed like lightning stood beside them. In their fright, the women bowed down with their faces to the ground, but the men said to them, Why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here. He has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still with you in Galilee, the Son of Man, Jesus, must be delivered over to the hands of sinners, be crucified, and on the third day be raised again. Then... They remembered his words. Look at that question one more time. When, why do you look for the living among the dead? Let that question sink in for a minute. Why do we look for the living among the dead? Why every time we get on the plane do we expect turbulence and fear turbulence to happen again? Why do we stand at the threshold of the future and allow the past to dictate to us what's going to be in the future? Why do we look for the living among the dead? What if we took that to the tombs that we face? What if we took that to our disappointments? What if we took that to our heartbreaks? What if we took that question to every time that we had learned to protect ourselves with the words, don't get your hopes up. Why do I look for the living and among the dead? The scripture says, here's what we'd find. Because Jesus has risen, the tomb need not be the end of our story. Because he has risen, let's make it more personal. Your tomb doesn't have to be the end of your story. Because Jesus has risen, your past doesn't have to be the end of your story. Because Jesus has risen, your mistakes, your failures, your regrets don't have to be the end of the story. Because Jesus has risen, the loss and the frustration and the hurt and the pain does not have to be the end of the story. Amen? Because he is, yeah, you can celebrate that. Because he has reason, risen, Jesus says, the tomb doesn't have to be the end of your story. You. Jesus doesn't say that there won't be tombs. I wish he did. <laughs> but he doesn't say that. Jesus, better than anybody perhaps, knows what those tombs were about. He knows what it means to, be su to suffer. He knows what it means to be spit upon. He knows what it's like to have his very best friends betray him and turn their back on him and not be there for him when he needed them the most. He knows what it's like to be put down and to be mistreated. He knows what it's like to be abused. He knows what it's like to be beaten. He knows what it's like to be nailed to a cross. He knows what it's like to be treated that way so unfairly. He knows all of that. He knows the tombs that we go through, and he does not make light of them. He doesn't want you to act like they don't happen. He doesn't need you to pretend they're okay when they're not. But what he invites us to see 
is that because he has risen, those tombs now, yes, they're real, but they are the end of a chapter, not the end of a story. And there's a big difference between the end of a chapter and the end of a story. When Seth was little, he had trouble understanding this. He, he would tell us, I, I don't like any story, Dad. I don't like any story, Mom, or any movie that has a bad guy in it. You know how hard it is to find a movie or a story? No, you can't because every good story has to have a conflict. If you don't have an obstacle or a challenge or a bad guy to overcome, you don't have a good story. It's not worth watching. And, and, so, and so we would tell Seth, Seth, every story has a bad guy, but if you watch it, you'll see the good guy overcome. And, but Seth would watch those movies. We watched the movie together as a family, and he would see the bad guy start to win and laugh, and, ah, 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 and the good guy to start to suffer and, and to be defeated. And Seth would be like, I'm out. We say, Seth, no, the movie's not over. He's, it's over for me. No, Seth, you've got to finish the movie. This isn't even going to, I don't care. I don't need it. I don't like it. I do not like that. I don't like that, seeing that. I don't want to, I don't want to watch that. I'm, I'm, I'm done. And I wonder how many of us do that. We go to our tomb. We go through our turbulence. And we say, I'm out. Nope, I'm done. That's the end. Close the book. Turn off the movie. That's the end. No, it's not the end. That's the chapter. No, no, no. For me, it's the end. I'm done. I'm finished. It's over. Dead is dead. Done is done. I'm done. I'm done. Get me out of here. I'm out. I'm done. And so we close the book before the book is over. And then what happens? Well, a little bit later, in the middle of the night, Seth comes to his mom's side of the bed. He knows not to come to my side of the bed. Because <laughs> he knows what I'm going to tell him. He goes to his mom's side of the bed. He says, Mommy. I'm scared. Kimberly says, why are you scared? Mommy, every time I close my eyes, I see that bad guy beating the good guy, and I just can't stand it. And then Kimberly does this, oh, come here, baby. I'm like, stop it. Oh, don't say, ah. Uh. He knows. I've been trying to teach him. We've been try we have been trying to teach him in all this young little life. Seth, you stopped the movie at the worst time. You checked out of the story at the worst time. You checked out when the enemy was winning and you didn't get to see how the good guy overcomes. And if you want to be able to sleep at night, if you want to have close your eyes and see something different than the villain laughing, then you've got to finish the story. And friends, the same applies for us because of Jesus' resurrection. Yes, you and I, whether we believe in him or not, we're all going to face tombs. But the difference between those who believe in him and those of us who don't believe in him is that when we go to a tomb, it's not the end of the story. It's the end of the chapter. And we get to say, yes, that's painful. Oh, that was awful. But the only thing worse than going to a tomb like that is thinking it's the end of the story. Nope, we're turning that page. God, let's see what's next. Amen? Amen. There's more to the story. Because Jesus has risen, your tomb doesn't have to be the end of your story. Yes, thank you, Jesus. So how do I, how do I live that? How do I believe that? How do I, how do I make that come true in my daily living, especially when I face the, the tombs? You have to dare to hope. Dare to hope again. Dare to hope in such a way that you actually invite Jesus to come with you to your tomb. Jesus has been there before. He's not going to be offended for you to invite him to your tomb. He's already gone there for you. Invite him to go there with you now. Jesus, come to my tomb. Some of, no doubt, somebody watching or somebody here today, there's, we have enough people this weekend who somebody, I have no doubt, has gone through a very recent tomb and it's still fresh. And those wounds are still open. Amen. Invite Jesus to come to that tomb. You say, what am I going to do with him once Jesus comes to that tomb? Why do I want to dig all that up? Why do I want to feel all that? Because you already are anyhow. You really are. Invite him to it. And then say, Jesus, I've been putting my hope in this tomb. I've been letting this tomb tell me it's the end long enough. I dare to turn and put my hope in you, Jesus. Because these tombs, they come and go. These tombs want me to think it's the end and it's over. But Jesus, if you 
came and you died and went to the tomb and you came out on the other side so that I could have hope that I could too, then Jesus, if you can make that possible, I'm putting my hope and trust in you today. Maybe your tomb was from a long time ago. A long time ago. So long ago that you say, it's silly to even think about it. I don't want to dig up that because that's so long ago. There's nothing anybody can ever do about it. You can't undo it. You can't know it. You can't unlearn it. I mean, it is what it is. It's just there. I don't want to even, but what if, what if that, what if you're already living there anyhow? And so why not take him and say, hey, Jesus, will you come with me? Come with me way back here. You know what you'll find? He's already there (laughs) waiting for you to see him there. Jesus, you know what this did to me. You know what they did to me. You know what message this has given me. You know how I've lived. Lord, I've tried. God, I have tried. I've tried to move forward. I've tried to get past. I've tried to get beyond. But you know how every time, every time I think I'm making a step forward, it's that from the past just grabs me and drags me back in the tomb. God, you're telling me I I have tried a thousand times for this not to be the end of my story, but it keeps coming up the same old story over and over again. But what if today, instead of putting your hope in that story that you've lived a hundred times, you would turn around and say, okay, God, what do I have got to lose? I'm putting all my hope and trust in you. I know what it's like to trust in that and end up back at the same place. I want you to take me someplace new. I believe that because of your death and resurrection, there's a new story for me. The chapter's closing. A new story's beginning. For some of us today, maybe it means we renew our commitment to him, renew our hope in him. You can remember the day when you were fully on fire for Christ and man, your hope was easy for you and you believed and you, and you looked up and when you worshiped, man, you held nothing back and you experienced God. It wasn't a doctrinal creed for you. This was a living relationship with the living God and, and you want that back. Today that can happen as you say, Lord, I'm sorry for the tombs that have been holding me back and making me numb. I'm turning back to you and I'm putting my trust fully in you again. And for someone here, someone watched it online, I've been praying all week long that for someone, this would be your first put your trust in Jesus moment. Man, there's no better day to put your trust in Jesus for the first time than on Easter, on Resurrection Sunday. On the day when God can say to you, listen, the tomb, yes, it's real. Oh, it's painful. No, you shouldn't have had to gone through it. But I'm not going to let that tomb have the final say of your life. I'm writing you a new story. And it is available to anybody who will receive it today. Amen? Amen. Yes, Jesus, I want that. Be the forgiver of my sins. Be the leader of my life. Be the hope of my life now. And someday when I face a tomb that puts me six foot under, I will have life eternal with you. Give me that hope, Jesus. You know what happened if we do that? What would happen is no matter what tomb tries to take from us, No matter what emptiness a tomb offers us, you would always find life. You would always see an end of a chapter and have your eyes wide open for the next part of the story. There was a a boy named Jeremy. And Jeremy was uh, born with a twisted body and a slow mind. And he was born with a chronic terminal illness. He had lived longer than what the doctors thought he would live. He was already 12 years old, but he was in a small town, and they didn't have the the resources for the specialized education he needed, and so the best they could do was put him as a 12-year-old into a second-grade class. And his teacher was Miss Miller, and she really was struggling with this. She was struggling with this because she didn't think it was fair for the other kids. I mean, it's hard enough to keep second graders focused, but Jeremy is uncontrollable, uh, involuntary movements and the grunting sounds he would sometimes make. It made it very difficult to help her have her keep her class focused. And and it wasn't fair to Jeremy because here he was a 12-year-old having to be in a class with second graders. And, And frankly, she didn't feel like it was fair for her. She wasn't equipped for this. She wasn't prepared for this. She was giving all this time and energy, she felt like, to one student who it seemed like no matter how hard she tried to teach him, she couldn't get him to learn. And then she was avoiding and missing out on helping the, other, the rest of her class. And so when parents came for a parent-teacher conference, Ms. Miller tried to gently encourage them to withdraw Jeremy from the school. 
And when Jeremy's mom began to cry and say, I don't know, this would crush Jeremy. If this is the one thing that he has that he feels like is normal in his life. And Miss Miller withdrew and didn't push the matter any further. A few weeks later, after that, uh, Miss Miller was sitting at her desk, and the class was supposed to be working on something, and, and Jeremy drug his twisted body up to her desk and, and said, Miss Miller, and Miss Miller said, Yes, Jeremy, what is it? You're supposed to be working on your, your assignment. And, and he said, Miss Miller, I love you. And for her, that was a little bit of a turning point because she realized in that moment how hard, how cold she had become towards Jeremy. And so she made up her mind, I'm going to really work on this. I'm going to have a better attitude. I'm going to see this as an opportunity and not as a, a distraction. And she really began to try to work on it, but it was hard. It was difficult for her. She had this internal struggle going on in her. And, and it came time for Easter time, and, and, and she decided, even though she was in a secular school, they were going to do a, a project on, uh, on how e springtime brings new life. And so she gave all the kids a little plastic Easter egg and said, tomorrow, bring it back filled with something that represents new life in spring. And so the next day, the kids came back, and they put their eggs up on, in the basket on Miss Miller's desk. And, and then right before recess, she got it out, all the eggs out, and she began to open them. The first one she opened, it had a flower. And the little girl said, that's mine. My mom helped me pick that flower because Miss Miller, a flower means new life in the springtime. Miss Miller said, that's good. That's right. They opened up the next egg, and it had a seed in it, and a little girl said, that's my grandpa. He plants a garden every springtime because seeds bring new life in the springtime, Miss Miller. Miss Miller said, that's right. That's good. Another little boy, he pulled, he, she opened his egg, and he said, that's mine. That's mine. He said, it's not pretty, but it's cool. It's a rock with moss on it. <laughs> he said, my dad said that represents new life, Miss Miller. She said, you're right. It does. And then she opened up the next egg, and as soon as she opened it, she knew that it was Jeremy's. Because she had experienced this all year long. No matter how many times she tried to explain, no matter how many times she thought she had gotten through about a particular assignment, Jeremy would show up the next day, and he wouldn't have done it right. And she thought for sure he understood that he was supposed to take that egg home, put something in it that represented a new life, and bring it back. She thought, she thought that he understood. He said he understood. But here she sat there with an egg that was empty. And so she quietly was going to set it aside so as not to embarrass Jeremy because she really was working on her attitude with him. And as she started to shove it aside, Jeremy blurted out, Miss Miller, that's my egg. And she said, Jeremy... Did you not understand the assignment? You were supposed to put something in it that represents new life at springtime, but your egg doesn't have anything in it. There's nothing to talk about. And he said, Miss Miller, Jesus' tomb was empty. My egg is empty because it reminds us that Jesus was killed and Jesus died. But on Easter, he came out alive. And so the tomb is empty. That's new life, Miss Miller. Yeah. Well, the recess bell rang. All the kids ran out. And Miss Miller said she was glad because she sat in her room and she sobbed. And all of a sudden she realized that that cold, bitter, hard part of her, it really wasn't about Jeremy. It was about something she had buried a long time ago in a tomb in her own self. And she said, I don't know what happened, but I began to pray out to God in my classroom. And asked for him to give me a hope that a little boy who had been dying since he was born had that I didn't. About three months later, she was standing at the casket of Jeremy next to Jeremy's parents. She offered her condolences, talked about her relationship with him. And, and then before she was to walk away, Jeremy's mother grabbed her arm and said, Miss Miller, before you go, we are so honored that all of Jeremy's classmates came today. But we don't understand something. Why do we have 19 empty Easter eggs in the <laughs> casket? <laughs> and Miss Miller said, because your son taught us in his state, in his condition, he taught us that where we see empty graves. Through Christ, we can see the hope of new life. Amen? Amen. Friends, that's for you.
because he has risen, your tomb, I'm not making light of it. I'm not saying it didn't hurt. I wish you didn't have to go through it. But the only thing worse than going through it is making that the end of the story rather than the end of the chapter that Jesus Christ says he's made it possible for being for you. You pray with me. Heavenly Father God, you are so good that you would send to us your one and only Son. That Jesus, you would go to the tombs that we hate going to. That you would suffer, that you would die. You know what it's like for us to go to those tombs. You don't make light of that. You don't ask us to pretend like those don't hurt and those are okay. But Lord, we are so thankful that you didn't just suffer and die. You came out of the grave. Do I believe that? Yes, I do. <laughs> you came out of the grave. And the reason I believe it, Lord, is because over the years, I've lived too much. <laughs> and I've seen too many times how you have taken people whose story should have ended with the tomb. And through your love, and your power, and your forgiveness, and your freedom. You take the very thing that should have been the end of the story, and you make it an end of the chapter, and you invite them in your name to turn the page so you can write a new story. Who do you want to do that for here today? Who's watching online that you want to do that for right now? Who in their seats right now would just say, Jesus, I'm tired of putting my hope in the tombs. Just tell him in a silent prayer. Just tell him. Tell him how that tomb makes you feel. Invite him to be there with you. And then tell him, Jesus, I'm not going to put my hope in that tomb anymore. Because all it wants to tell me is that it's over. I'm turning to you for the first time. I'm turning to you again as though it's the first time. Jesus, I choose by faith to put my hope in you. I receive that tomb as a closed chapter. And I receive your resurrection as my permission to hope again. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus, for what you're doing in us right now. And I pray your spirit would continue to work in us and give us permission to hope again as we sing this song together. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.